my name is Federico Links, um, and I'm the editor of Namibia Fact Check. And the, this is Ask the Experts, a, a, an initiative of the um, Namibia Media Trust and um, ourselves, Namibia Fact Check. Um, so um, in this episode, we'll be talking again to Dr. Eric Juban, who is the um, country country head of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention of the US um, and who is assisting Namibia um, in its COVID-19 efforts. Um, so Dr. Juban, thank you very much for joining us this morning, for making the time to join us this morning. Um, so the title of this episode is Festive Season Surge. Um, and I mean, the figures of the last seven days have certainly been telling. Um, over the last, over the seven day period for, um, from the 8th to the 14th of, of, of December, we've recorded 1,507 cases um, at an average of 215 new cases per day. Um, for the four day period from the 10th to the 13th um, alone, we recorded 1,064 cases, new cases. Um, and, and the average there was 266 um, new cases uh, per day for the four, year, four day period. What does this tell us, doctor? Well, we are definitely in a surge. We are definitely in a second wave. And in some ways, it's actually worse now than it has been the entire year in Namibia. Uh, we did have the, our last wave really peaked at the end of August. Uh, at that time, we had three days in a row with more than 300 cases. Uh, last week, we had two days with over 300 cases as well, including last Friday was our most ever recorded in a day at 324. But a big difference that I think is so important for people to understand is that uh, our hospitals in August were quite empty of everything not related to COVID. You'll remember we had been in some pretty strict uh, re re regulations. Some would say a lockdown. That's sort of a loaded word. I think sometimes we call things lockdowns that are, are not really lockdowns there. But, you know, there were a lot of restrictions. Hospitals had canceled or postponed any of their operations or procedures that were not urgent. A lot of that stuff had been pushed away to make room in the hospitals for the growing cases of COVID. Uh, as well, you know, they were generally fully staffed. But now fast forward to December, uh, a lot of those cases that had been postponed all year were already taking place then in the last several weeks. And that's not a bad thing. There are still important medical procedures. We're not just talking about, you know, cosmetic surgery or, or something that's completely optional, this might be a back surgery or uh, an internal um, intestinal surgery that wasn't necessary immediately, could wait a little bit, but couldn't wait forever. The doctors, the surgeons, the nurses, they were catching up on these sorts of things over the last several weeks. So the hospitals were quite full of those. Also, we know that because uh, restrictions on movement around the country and the sale of alcohol and opening hours had gone away, uh, most of those restrictions were gone. That meant that there were also just more people in the hospital for motor vehicle accidents or injuries related to alcohol and, and, and violence and things like this. So the hospitals were not empty this time around. Also some hospital workers were already on their holiday leave and we have a lot of health workers in Namibia from outside the country, some of them already outside the country. So when, the, when this second wave started quite rapidly, the hospitals were not in a place of starting from being empty and fully prepared to deal with it. We've also seen that more healthcare workers are getting uh, infected in the last couple of weeks than ever before in Namibia. So then of course they are in isolation or they are in, uh, in quarantine if they're exposed and that decreases the capacity of the hospitals even more. So, in a lot of ways, Namibia is worse off now than it has been at any point previously this year in terms of COVID. 
And I think if you talk to uh, my colleagues that work in the hospitals, in the clinics, they will definitely, uh, with a sense of urgency and almost a sense of panic about the situation. And, and, and these are folks that have been very calm throughout the entire year. Uh, we had has hospital capacity to get us through the first wave. They don't feel as confident this time around. So it is urgent. And I would urge uh, the media, people here, your colleagues, uh, please be reaching out to the hospitals, the public and the private hospitals, uh, particularly here in Windhoek, they're stretched very thin. And I think their stories need to be told uh, because it's hard for the public to understand how bad the situation is when they go to the mall and it kind of looks like business as usual. Uh, they're walking the streets near the shops, they're in their neighborhoods. It doesn't feel that different maybe to them. But if they knew how full the hospitals are, how limited they are to take new cases in, not just COVID cases, but anything. If you or I needed urgent medical attention today, it's gonna to be really hard for the hospitals to take care of us because they are so full right now. So I hope the media can help tell their stories because if there's anything that does get people to change their behavior and take COVID seriously, knowing that the hospital they rely on for their own emergent needs is fully booked uh, is something that really can be a wake up call. Yeah, I mean, just just on that uh, that issue of of people knowing and people um, acting responsibly, um, what is driving the surge at the moment? Why are we seeing this right now? It's hard to say. It's hard to pinpoint any one uh, activity. I know a lot of people have said, "Was it the election rallies? Um, different things." We know what stops surges. I think that's a good place to start. We know that if we keep our gatherings small, if we wear masks when we're out in public, if we need to be gathered with other people, have a mask on, space yourselves out, don't crowd closely together, have your activities and events outdoors instead of indoors. We know those are the things that stop surges. That's what helped us last time around. Uh, that's what helped countries all over the world to stop this. And Generally, you can see a very clear correlation that the countries that stop those kind of indoor unmasked gatherings, those are the countries that don't have surges or when they have them, they get rid of them quite quickly. So we know what stops surges. And then we can look at Namibia and say, well, we've gotten very relaxed in the last couple of months and it's become easier and easier for people to just disregard the regulations. When I do go out occasionally, it's, it is amazing to see how many people are just very comfortable having no mask on, even if they're in the shop, standing in line at the till, um, talking loudly on their phone, just half a meter away from you. It's, it's shocking in a way. Uh, so this seems to be what's happening in Namibia. Uh, it's also what's happening in South Africa. They're definitely having quite a second wave right now as well. And it's not surprising that we would follow the same pattern as them. I think a lot of us hoped that because of the warmer weather, maybe we would have a longer time delay until a second wave, but that's just not been the case. And this virus throughout the world has shown that it's very good at spreading in every weather condition possible. It may still be that the virus does better in certain weather conditions, maybe drier, colder climates, but it can do just fine in hot, humid, dry, cold, high elevation, low elevation, crowded cities, rural areas, it's, it spreads well in all of those. We've seen that time and time and time again all year. So it's unfortunate that now we're having this second wave when we're really not that far out from our first one. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing for me is also this, this lack of now, it's almost as if people have have uh, you know adopted this attitude? Covid is over. The state of emergency is over. Covid is over, um, and and this is, I mean, as you said, this is this is problematic. So how do you how do we how do we turn adhere to the rules which are still there? The regulations are still in force, um, and even some. I mean, I see some government departments are also confused about uh, the 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 regulations, but the regulations are still in force. What, what needs to happen now if we want to, I mean, in South Africa, they're having the same um, discussions around 
um, you know, the public needs to take responsibility. It can't just be a situation of state authorities, the relevant state, state authorities and law enforcement um, having to come down on people um, to, to adhere to the rules. Um, and 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 they've gone into this this um, what is called now the covert fatigue um, and, and and the regulation and, and the guidance so what how do we how do we get people to to adhere to the guidance and to the rules at this stage when when this is busy happening yeah it's a challenge that the whole world is facing i think this pandemic fatigue is not limited to namibia it's certainly in my home country it's in countries throughout the world, it's getting difficult uh, to get people to the place they need to be to keep themselves safe and keep the community safe. Part of it is government regulations. I think we'll hear later today uh, from the head of state about the next plans for that. Part of it definitely is enforcement. Like you said, there are some regulations that are still in place that it's not hard to find And enforcement doesn't just have to be from law enforcement. It's also the shops and the restaurants. Um, and and I, I was at a building the other day and I had to go in for just a moment. And the security guards were very clear, put your mask on before you go in. And that was great. That's, we just need, it doesn't have to be dramatic or uh, emotional. It should just be second nature right now. In the same way that you or I wouldn't try to go to a restaurant or, or the mall without our shirts on, you shouldn't be trying to do it without your mask on either. It's just at this point, uh, it's just like wearing a shirt. It's just common decency for the people that you're going to be around uh, when you're going into a church, if you're going into a store, uh, if, you're going, if your children are going to school, keep your shirt on, keep your mask on. It's, it's not that hard. Uh, so hopefully, um, honestly, I think what I mentioned before is a big part of it though, because how do we get people to change their behavior? If they are seeing the stories coming out of the hospitals, I think that can really change things. If they know that there are people showing up to clinics needing oxygen, but there's no beds to put them in, and those people are being kept in parked ambulances with an oxygen mask on until they can try to figure out a place that they can transfer them, that is a story that people need to hear because ultimately that is a huge part of why we even talk about uh, needing to bend the curve, needing to lower the curve, needing to uh, control or mitigate the size of these surges. It's not just about how many people are getting sick. It's about our healthcare system and its ability to take care of the people that it needs to, right? So we don't have an unlimited number of hospital resources, beds, oxygen, ventilators, doctors, nurses, those are all limited resources. And when we are dealing with a pandemic that has lower numbers than what we can handle, when we can handle all the numbers of it, then people get the care they need. Some people still die. Even when there's hospital capacity, some people still unfortunately don't make it. They don't survive uh, their infections. But when we reach the point where the numbers of people needing the hospital gets over that threshold, it, it, eclipses how many resources we have available to them, then the number of people dying from this virus will go up because now you have people who could have survived if they had a ventilator, but there's no ventilator for them. Or they could survive with just some oxygen in a mask, but then there's no oxygen. Or being monitored by a nurse overnight in a hospital bed, they could survive, but instead they have to go home because the hospitals are full. I'm not saying we're exactly there right now, but if people know that that risk is there and that we're getting close to it, that could be the difference. That could be what changes people's behaviors. Because I think Namibians, particularly Namibians that have a lot of resources themselves, people that live comfortably, uh, upper or middle class, it's easy to get comfortable that you have this great safety net. You have some really nice hospitals that you can go to if things get bad, they'll, they'll sort it out and you'll be just fine. You know, I've heard quotes, just like you, I've heard quotes about COVID is over. I've heard quotes saying, well, you can't just close things down because there's a couple people with a cough. 
there's a lot of people that just still don't take it seriously. But to know that the hospitals are absolutely full of people who are sick and dying from this virus, who are struggling to breathe, who are suffocating on their own lungs, that could be the difference. That could be the wake up call we need. But part of that requires the media to really um, get those stories, get the footage, get the photos. Obviously that's sensitive. You can't just be taking pictures of people in the hospital beds without their permission, but to whatever extent the media can ethically be showing what's going on in those settings. What's going on right now at Robert Mugabe Clinic with the lines going on forever and some of the people showing up unable to breathe. What's going on at cath care and NIP right now with people standing in line for hours to get their test, hearing people coughing in line in front of them and behind them, worrying that they're getting more exposed while they're going to try to get their, their testing done. The more we can have those stories told, my hope would be people could finally change their behaviors and say, you know, maybe that holiday party isn't so important. Maybe we could just postpone it. Um, Christmas will still come even without the parties, the traditions we normally do. Maybe I'll wait to visit Grammy a couple more months and see if things are better. I'd rather have her around for next Christmas than force a dangerous situation with her this Christmas. I just want to go back to the, you know, sort of the, the health sector capacity issues. I mean, we've now seen, um, I think it's now over 600 um, healthcare workers um, have tested positive. Um, how severe is the situation actually? And if this, you know, if, if, if these numbers keep up going into and over the festive season into the new year, what, what will the impact um, say come January of, you know, so the, the more cases we have, the more like is the, the greater the likelihood that more health workers will be infected. What does this look like? So a few weeks from now in, into the new year. I think the next few weeks are really uh, critical. It's, it's gonna, a lot's happening right now. We have this huge surge of cases happening at a time where the hospital was dealing with a lot of backed up other issues that have been accumulating all year, and at a time when so many staff were gone. Uh, some of them already on their holiday leave, and I know there are some hospitals retrenching them, pulling them back from leave, but sometimes that's, that's not so easy. Some of them might already be far away on the globe, possibly. Uh, when all this is happening, every healthcare worker getting infected and going into quarantine or isolation, uh, that hurts that we don't have any to spare right now. Now, fortunately, most of those healthcare workers are going to recover and they're going to be able to go back to work. So month by month by month, the healthcare workers getting infected right now should not hurt our overall capacity, except for the ones that don't make it. And that has happened, unfortunately, a few times where we've lost our healthcare workers, uh, tragically. Uh, for the ones who survive, most of the time they can go back to work and that's good. But in the next few weeks, we're going to be dealing with some really tough shortages because of the holiday leave combined with the sudden surge. And you're right, they are more likely to get exposed. Now, uh, we do everything we can to make sure our healthcare workers can have proper protective equipment whenever they're being exposed in the clinical settings. But they're also getting exposed when they're at the shops and when they're at home and when their children come home from school. Um, so I, I want people to consider that when you're standing in the queue at the grocery store and you have your mask down on your chin and you're talking on the phone, that person just half a meter away from you might be the doctor or the nurse that you need to be healthy when you get sick a week from now and need hospital care. And that hospital might be less ready to take care of you, whether it's your COVID or a car accident, or a pneumonia, or a heart attack, that hospital might be less ready to take care of you because their doctor, because they're getting exposed to people without masks in the grocery queues, things like that. We all need to do our part. And so uh, it's gonna be tough for a few weeks here. And I think that the healthcare capacity is the main part of the story right now people need to know about because that's what's going to take it from a bad situation to a much worse one. 
So there have been some questions that we received beforehand. Um, I think, I mean, I, I'll, I'll leave the, the vaccine question to later, but um, there are a few questions actually on vaccines. So somebody asked, um, are, once, you've, uh, um, once you've gotten COVID-19, um, can you, are you immune to it? Will you get it again? Um, I think this is a question that sort of vexing people around the world um, and, and, and politicians are, I think, playing, uh, using this as a political ball um, in some places. So if you've had COVID-19, can you get it again? Yes, at least some people can. We now have evidence from many countries around the world of specific cases where somebody definitely had COVID-19 once, and then several weeks or months later, they definitely got it again. And sometimes these have uh, been well-documented and, and they were in places where they could even study the genetic code of this specific virus they were infected with and prove it was not just a recurrence of their previous infection. It wasn't just a long infection that got better and then worse again. So, so we know it's possible sometimes for people to get reinfected. What we don't know yet is, is it always possible? Are there some people after they're infected that keep their immunity for a very long time? It seems like most people keep their immunity for at least three to four months. And a good number of people keep their immunity for six to seven months. We really can't say much beyond that. Part of that's just because it's a new virus, uh, but we keep learning more and more about this. We know some things make you less likely to be immune after you get infected. So if your immune system is already compromised, let's say you're a cancer patient getting chemotherapy, let's say you have HIV that's not controlled on medication, let's say you have some other autoimmune disease that affects your immune system and your ability to create antibodies, to create uh, the, the blood cells that you need to, to have immunity. Uh, in those cases, you might be able to get it again more quickly. Uh, but most people, it seems at least for several months, are immune after they get it. We just don't know what that cutoff is and there seems to be some variation based on your own personal factors of your body, your immune system, your overall health. We also don't know with the vaccine, how long will the vaccine give people immunity? That's still an unanswered question and we're gonna have to learn over time. Uh, do we need to keep getting this vaccine every year or less than every year or uh, it, will it actually give us protection that'll last for several years? We, we just still need to learn these things. Just on that question then, I mean, on, on, on the vaccine um, situation. So we know that, um, you know, Namibia is part of the Gavi initiative um, and we will eventually get um, um, a batch of vaccines here in Namibia. Um, but the thing is when, question is when. So, I mean, The Economist this week had a very interesting graphic showing um, which parts of the world will, you know, will get the vaccine first and, you know, sort of when they will get it. And Namibia, for Namibia, the graphic shows we'll, we're only in line um, for a vaccine um, in the first half of 2022. So we have a whole year uh, plus to go. If, if this is true, we have a whole year, whole year and, and some months to go before um, actual vaccination starts here in, in uh, COVID-19 vaccination starts here in Namibia. Um, so what, you know, where does that leave us? Um, and, and also, I mean, maybe you could also then sort of just talk about the vaccines out there at the moment and, and what is being said and what the evidence shows. And the US this week started actual, actually yesterday um, uh, uh, vaccinating um, healthcare workers and, and elderly in, in care homes. Um, so maybe you could, you could speak to those issues as well, um, as well as where we stand in terms of Gavi and, and the funding of Gavi, which seems to be a big issue at the moment. Um, what, what is the situation there? Yeah, it's so 
first of all, let me just say that I'm really excited the vaccines are being developed. I'm excited that we have a couple of that have shown such strong results in studies, that we have one that's been approved by some countries. Uh, I'm hoping more countries will be able to review and approve it coming up. It'll be able to get distributed widely. Uh, my sister is a healthcare worker and she just told me this morning that she's scheduled to get vaccinated on Friday. I'm so happy. I can worry a little less about her now. Um, so it's really good news that the vaccines are, are arriving, but you're right, they're not available immediately for everybody. Um, I, I also read The Economist, I, I like their work a lot, but they don't know, I, they're, they're giving estimations. We're not sure at this point when Namibia will get vaccine. By joining COVAX, I think Namibia put themselves in the best possible position to have access for at least some of the population to vaccine when it is becoming available for a wider uh, spread of countries. And there's a lot of work already happening behind the scenes here in Namibia, led by the Ministry of Health, on what to do to prepare for the vaccines. Because it's a many step process, as you can imagine. Public education is enormous. Uh, people are not just gonna say, oh, there's a vaccine, come, come give it to me. People need to understand some of the facts about it. Uh, the logistics are challenging. Uh, the current vaccines that are approved require two doses. Some of the ones in the development do not require a second dose, uh, but things like that. How do you document who's been vaccinated or not? You need an entire data system to really keep track of these things properly. How do you uh, give people documentation that they themselves have been vaccinated? We know at some point we're going to hear that it's required to get on certain airplanes maybe, or to go to certain conferences or to go on a cruise ship, you're gonna to have to show proof of vaccination. Just like many countries right now require proof of vaccination for yellow fever before you can enter the country. Or you need, in America, you usually need proof of measles vaccination for a child to enter a public school. So how do we, how do we set up the system? How do we try to make it um, resistant to forgeries and things like this? Uh, these are, there are a lot of complicated questions. Namibia is working on those things right now. We are supporting them uh, at CDC. We're, we're partnering with them to deal with some of these issues and be as prepared as possible so that when vaccines do become available, uh, and Namibia has done what they can do, I believe, to try to make sure that they can access these vaccines once they become available, uh, that there'll be a plan in place because that's only half the battle. And a country that has boxes of vaccine vials uh, sitting on the tarmac at their airport but no plan for how they're gonna distribute them well is not in good shape. We need to be a country that when those boxes of vaccines fly in, the plans are there so that they can immediately be used properly. They can go to the most needed places. Um, most countries understand that that's often the elderly, people living in elderly care facilities, the people working those facilities, the frontline health workers, people with other pre-existing conditions that put them at risk. So. I'm glad that Namibia is doing that planning now and not waiting until the vaccine shows up and then working on a plan. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I hope we, we get this right. And yes, I mean, I, 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 I'm fully with you that, you know, I, I don't also think the economist has it, has it uh, you know, has the inside track on the information regarding when vaccines will be available, but it's sort of, was an interesting graphic and also i mean i misspoke there i called the uh, covax gavi it was just a mixer um so i was referring to the covax facility um yeah um i think we've answered the questions around the vaccine um because there was something about the will it protect and you know how many times will we have to get it um so yeah so I'm sure you've um, you've been part of the discussions um, leading up to today's um, presidential um, briefing, um, and and you're probably not able to you know to go into what we can expect, um, but I mean if there's something you can tell us at this stage about you know what what is coming. Um, um, and, and what people, you know, because by the time um, people watch this, a lot of the, the, the media and, and, and some journalists watch this, 
um, you know, that statement will have already been delivered. So maybe there's something you could you could share um, at this time with us, uh, what we can look forward to. Well, I think what I can say is that there's a lot of valuable information that gets gathered that helps uh, the government here, uh, cabinet and ultimately the head of state to make the decisions that people hear about in today's announcement. Um, and it's not always easy to gather. It doesn't just come naturally. It takes a lot of work. There's a lot of people working behind the scenes to understand the expanse of the epidemic. Where are the hot spots right now? We all know that Windhoek is particularly affected, but it's not the only one by far. Um, I'm, I'm quite concerned about a number of that Luteritz has been struggling with a large outbreak. Um, what's interesting about Luteritz is their cases are lower than Wintook, but because Luteritz is such a smaller community, if you talk about per population rates of new cases every day, Luteritz is actually higher, not just than Wintook right now, but higher than Wintook was back in, higher than Volvish Bay was at the beginning of this all. Luteritz has had the largest outbreak per population of on now for quite a few weeks. Uh, we're also seeing Carlsberg district really going up in numbers and all of Irongo, the coast uh, to go up again, but Omaruru and Osakos, and then just going northeast from there, Ocho Irongo, Okakarara, Oka uh, Sumeb, all of these places are actually having and the test positivity is going up. So this is something we test positivity means of all the last week in a certain district, how many of them were positive? We want that number to be less than 3% or less than 5% because that means you're doing enough testing that you're probably catching most of your cases. It's not a perfect measure of that. It's very hard to know how many cases you're not catching because by the nature of not catching them, they're hard to know. But when we see the positivity in some districts go up to 10 or 20%, that's worrisome because that means that there are probably so many cases being undetected for each one that gets caught. So by looking at the test positivity and by looking at the number of new cases and comparing that number of new cases to the population size, so then you have a per capita incidence rate, that really helps us see where, where the concerning areas are. And that's why I mentioned the ones that I mentioned as uh, being concerning right now, even though sometimes it's easy to ignore them because you just see that big Windhoek number at the top of the chart and say, oh, Windhoek is really where the problem is right now. Well, some of these smaller towns are struggling as well, and they have less clinics, less hospital beds, et cetera. There's parts of this country that don't have a single ventilator in an entire region. So we do need to pay attention to the, the regions as well. So, so that sort of data uh, is being presented to the Minister of Health, he takes it to cabinet, it's presented to the head of state. So they have those things available when they're making their decisions. They're also recognizing the importance of the economy and trying to uh, preserve people's jobs, preserve people's uh, livelihoods at the same time. They're not easy decisions. Uh, there's, there's always trade-offs as countries are dealing with this. What I'll say is that I've been watching carefully the second wave in Europe. Uh, you know, Europe had a huge wave far back much earlier in the year. And then for months, most European countries had very, very few cases. They still did a lot of testing. They're still being cautious, but they were able to reopen their economies quite well. Uh, then the second wave came, I guess about October, we really started seeing it. And it was even larger than their first wave. I think some people got discouraged and they said, wow, if even Europe can't get these things under control, what hope do the rest of us have? But what's interesting is many European countries, that second wave came and went pretty quickly and they're already seeing their numbers come down by a lot. They've already gotten through it, it maybe a month. Uh, but when they took it very seriously, and for some of them that meant lockdowns, that meant really strict regulations, by doing that and everybody buying in, it didn't have to linger on forever it was over within a matter of a few weeks, not over, but the worst of it was over and their health systems could take a bit of a breath again and they were out of that crisis point. 
So I think there's lessons to be learned there that sometimes these regulations, uh, nobody's excited about them. Nobody wants more regulations. But when they're taken seriously, when they're comprehensive, sometimes they can get us through the worst of this pretty quickly, and then they can be rolled back again. And we go back to continuing to monitor closely and watch for another wave. To tie it back to your vaccine question, I think that's what Namibia needs to do. That's what all countries need to do. They need to plan and respond to this pandemic as though there's no vaccine on the way. That might sound surprising, but if we treat it like, well, there's a vaccine almost here, so let's just kind of do our thing until the vaccine gets here, we'll end up in a worse place and, and people die from that type of an approach. But if we handle this virus as though there is no vaccine coming, take it seriously, keep it under control, then when the vaccine comes, we're in a far better place to get it out to people and to stop this thing once and for all. But in the meantime, uh, just hoping it shows up isn't the right course. Just like, um, you know, if you're out in a storm uh, and driving through, just waiting for a better driver to come through isn't gonna help. <laughs> you need to do the best you can with what you have right now. And then maybe more resources can come across later. And I think Namibia realizes that. Yeah, so I mean, uh, you you uh, didn't actually <laughs> give us much to go on, but I, I sort of get what you're saying between the lines there. Um, You've only yeah, got 30 I, minutes I, to wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's less than 30 minutes. It's, it's 20 <laughs> minutes now. Um, yes, I mean, so so um, where where is the CDC in all of this? What What are you busy doing? Um, in terms of assisting Namibia at this stage? Well, we've certainly stayed busy all year. Uh, CDC in Namibia, we work hand in hand in several parts of the response. We never had our own emergency operations center. We didn't have a, a CDC emergency operations center where we were doing our own tracking, our own policies, nothing like that. We just talked to the ministry from day one. Really, we were talking about this back in January when we were first seeing it show up in, in China and then other countries. So well before uh, we had our first cases in March here in Namibia, we were in collaboration with the Ministry of Health and Social Services on the planning. And we've stayed there ever since. Uh, we've never really left that role. So uh, I have staff from my office currently working in the laboratories currently sitting with the surveillance teams, currently supporting data management, currently working with case management on hospital policies and, and treatment guidelines. Um, you know, I'm honored to, to talk with some of the leadership uh, time, time by time. They, they're very good at being open and transparent. You know, there are countries that when something like this happens, they get defensive, they worry about looking bad and they pull away from their partners. And Namibia hasn't been that kind of a country. So organizations like CDC, like WHO, we've been here for many years. Uh, we've supported them through other health emergencies in the past, and there's a lot of trust both ways. And they have been uh, really good, I think, all year about just recognizing the strength that comes from maintaining those partnerships and keeping everyone engaged together. So we're all working really closely together and that's what we do. We, we don't lead any of this. We're following the ministry's lead and we're providing uh, sometimes resources. That's great when we're able to uh, bring in physical resources for the response and we've been able to do that several times, but it's also the technical assistance and the uh, expert opinion, the experiences from colleagues in other countries. So CDC has country offices and pretty much every country in Southern and East Africa, as well as many Western African countries and other countries around the world. So I have a lot of colleagues that I get to talk to very frequently and hear about what's happening in their countries. And sometimes they've come up with something clever or stumbled upon something concerning that we hadn't dealt with yet that would allow us to get a little bit of a head start on that issue. So um, that's been CDC's role. Uh, we're happy to continue doing it. We're not planning on leaving anytime soon. We're, we're here for the long haul. Uh, because it's affecting our lives too. My family is here in this house with me. Uh, you know, my friends, the people I care about, we're all depending on this going well here in Namibia as well. So uh, we'll, we'll stick with it.
Yeah. Um, so, Doctor, I want to talk a bit about, you know, sort of the the disinformation, the disinfodemic that that has accompanied COVID nineteen and is now um, building up again around. It has sort of died down up to this point, but it's now building up again around the, you know, the, the vaccines and the potential vaccines um, and the candidate vaccines still in development. So there's a lot of anti-vaccine sentiment out there on social media at the moment, um, and 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 the volume of it is expected to grow. So, what would your, you know, what would your advice be for for, for local media um, um, operating in this space where we're starting to see this, you know, this flood busy building again in the distance, and it it will come for us once. We get closer to a vaccine being rolled out in Namibia. What 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 can be done? Well, I, I'm glad you're asking that because I think the media really does have a crucial role in this. Um, I think the science communication science has shown really clearly that it's very important to be uh, to be right, <laughs> but also to be first uh, and to be clear. And it can be hard to do all those things at once. And what I mean is. If people are hearing the wrong information about something like a vaccine or like treatments for COVID or like the source of the virus or how you can infect other people, if they get the wrong information about that for a long time before they hear the right information, it's too late. They've probably already created a worldview around the, the false information that's been fed to them. So it is important for the media to be fast on these things and to address the truth uh, as soon as the rumors are starting to pop up. But of course, it's also important to be right uh, and to not just say something fast, but to say something accurate. It's okay for us to say what we don't know. And I've seen some interesting studies recently, specifically about COVID, that people are absorbing the messages better when the uncertainty is acknowledged. Uh, I've certainly tried to do, you're aware I've been in a lot of media settings this year, more than the rest of my life put together easily. Uh, and I've tried to be clear about the things we don't know. So even today saying, we don't know exactly when the vaccine will arrive, saying we don't know how long it will give protection. We don't know uh, once you've had the virus. I used to say, we don't know if you can get it a second time because we didn't know back in March and April and May but now we do know some people at least can, but like I said earlier in this hour, we don't know uh, how many people, if some people have immunity that lasts much longer, what the range is. So when we acknowledge what we don't know, uh, people actually respect that and they're more likely to take what you're saying seriously because most people can see through false bravado. If you just act like you know everything, you have all the answers, they can sniff that out and then they dismiss all the information you're giving them. So how does the media fit into that? I think really reporting the facts consistently and frequently, addressing rumors as soon as they come up. I'm always happy to you know, take calls from journalists and they say, doc, you know, what about this new thing that people are saying, blah, blah, blah. I say, no, that's absolutely not true. What we do actually know is this is what works or this is how this happens. Uh, so just trying to tamper down those uh, rumors as much as we can, because they're very harmful. They are extremely harmful. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's one thing I wasn't expecting this year was the degree that the misinformation would really uh, drive the story so many times and the suspicions and such things and having WhatsApp on our phones and, and apps like that, how much that has allowed some of these crazy uh, stories, some of these absurd theories to just get momentum. And if you put it on a kind of slick looking graphic, people look at that and think, oh, it must be true. <laughs> it has this nice graphic on it. Um, and that's really a shame, but the media can fight back with your own slick graphics with accurate information on them. Uh, and again, I'll go back to something I said earlier. And I think we have a couple of people that uh, arrived on this call since then, but telling the stories from the hospital. You know, it's one thing for somebody to be spreading false information that says COVID is not that serious. It's not even as deadly as a regular flu. Uh, it's all a hoax. 
most people who have the virus, you know, it's not even really in their body, the test is just wrong, whatever these false uh, theories are, it's hard for that to hold weight if you have photos or video of your local hospital completely full with people sitting on stretchers in the parking lot or in an ambulance, interviewing a doctor, the head of the unit saying, we can't take any more people today. We had to transfer people from a private hospital to a state hospital yesterday because we were out of beds. The more people are hearing that, it gets really hard to take seriously all this nonsense saying it's all a hoax, it's not a big deal. They know what those hospital beds are. <laughs> they know that people don't just go and get intubated because they're uh, you know, suckers and they're buying into a hoax. Those are real people sick and dying. And so tell those stories and that's probably the best ammunition we have against the misinformation out there. Yeah, I mean, that's, I'm fully with you there. Um, and that's something that, I mean, you know, you, you do see some of the coverage and addresses some of the issues, but it doesn't delve in that deeply. It's more, it's more report based, um, what an official is saying. And you, and I do think there's place for, for journalists here in Namibia to go the extra mile, to go deeper and, and, and present the story that way. Um, but there's the other side, the the communication from from um, from the government side. I mean, I've, I've 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 over the months I've spoken to people, so we get this daily, you know, the daily update, uh, a few pages from the minister, um, which are also read at the communication center um, with a table and so on. Um, but you know, I get the sense, and having spoken to people that. Um, this is now, it's, it's not that interesting. So people aren't listening to it. Um, people aren't, uh, aren't listening, aren't watching the, the daily communication or listening to the daily communications, all that, uh, much. Um, so there's an issue with, um, with, with how the information, the urgency of, of some of this information is being communicated by, by the ministry of health and other authorities. Uh, uh, operating in this space. Um, so there's an issue and, and, and a few, about two months ago, I was in a call um, like this one, ask the experts with um, the Ministry of Health uh, um, executive director and some of his team um, involved in the COVID-19 response. And it was said that the ministerial communication around COVID-19 would be, you know, would be elevated and, and escalated um, in coming into the 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 festive season, um, as you know we we were looking towards this already back then. This was in October, um, looking already back then at you know this there might be a second wave, and now that we are here, I mean I'm I'm to be honest I'm not seeing this ramped up um, communication, and and. Um, I mean, so so there there is clearly an issue there, and, and this this daily update format um, on on you know a few pages being read out by the minister and then posted out on a media group, um, and then uh, journalists reporting from there, um, isn't really doing the trick. What, what what do you think needs to improve on the government communication side? Well. You know, it's, it's an important issue. I'll say just, you know, as a starting point, it's hard to be interesting uh, talking about the same topic for an entire year. It's hard to be engaging and feel relevant when sometimes it does feel like you have said the same thing over and over and over again for, you know, now going on a 12th month. Um, and I know that that that's a challenge for everyone. That's a challenge for media producers that are trying to create content that is of interest to the public. I think it's a challenge for people like me that are often, you know, uh, I get reached out to from the media, from radio or TV or print media, online media frequently. Um, and I'm sure there are times where they would rather I gave a quote that was more explosive, <laughs> make a headline or something, but uh, you're trying to be accurate and you're talking about something that 
is very similar to what's been talked about month after month. But I agree, the effort still has to be there. I think it could be tricky also. I mean, I was on a TV show, I think it was last week, um, might have been the week before, but it was their last live taping. It was their last new material they were going to be doing for the year. They were basically stopping that television show uh, for the rest of December. So, so even some of the outlets for the message to get out are winding down and that can make it harder. And I'll say the ministry does, again, just like I said, they're very good at being transparent with us about the data and the planning. Um, they're also very good about bringing us in uh, to do public uh, uh, engagement. So oftentimes, whether it's the communication center or whether they are being invited onto NBC or other media channels, uh, they ask for myself or somebody from WHO to join them and to participate in that. So they're very open to having not just one Ministry of Health spokesperson be the only one giving out official information, uh, but they're happy to have other voices in there, external partners, people from different pillars of the response speaking to what's going on as well. So I think that's a good thing, uh, but you're raising this issue of it's, there are limited ways to get it out. I think sometimes it is up to the media to take, you know, I realize that these daily three page reports, they're not always exciting, but they're not really meant to be. They're been, meant to be very factual. They're meant to be the official source of the numbers. If there are interesting stories coming out of them, I think sometimes it does take the media to dig those up then. Um, and I, I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong, you know, should it be more the government is really highlighting the in interesting or important angles of it, or is it up to the media to look at the numbers and dig into that themselves? I mean, it's not really for me to say which would be preferable, but I think the reality is it helps for both to happen. So again, for instance, when you see that there are a lot of cases of Luterates, not as many as Wintook, but enough to say, well, hold on, there are not that many people in Luterates. So something's really going on there. You know, is it worth trying to get some reporting out of Luterates to tell that story in more depth than just a number on a piece of paper? Uh, I think that's valuable for the country to understand that. Uh, those numbers on a paper are necessary and it's a very important starting point. But whenever the media can go deeper than that, and talk to the doctors, talk to the clinics, um, talk to the workplaces uh, or the schools where it's been reported that there have been outbreaks. You know, talk to a school two weeks after their outbreak and say, what did you learn from that? What did you change, right? It's very easy to find people in Namibia who have not been personally affected, who will say, I'm not gonna worry about that, it's no big deal. But you find someone after they've been personally affected, after their mother died, or after they had to go to the hospital, or after they missed two weeks of work uh, due to their sickness, or after they recovered, but they're still having symptoms. They still can't taste their food a month later. Um, you'll get a different story from them. They might say something like, I wish I would have taken it more seriously. I believed all those people saying it was no big deal, and boy, was I wrong. And now I know that. Please take it from me. Don't go through what I went through. That was awful. You should definitely be taking it more seriously. There's no reason not to wear a mask in the shops the whole time you're in there. Don't just pull it up when you walk past the security guard and pull it down again. That doesn't do any good. There are people out there who could tell those stories. And I think the more the media follows up on that, that's gonna do far more, in my opinion, that's gonna do more than just having a media center update every day. That's gonna help people identify their own lives with what's going on around them. Yeah, that, that, that's a good message. Um, so, I think we'll leave it there. Um, but if you have anything that you would like to add, um, you know, anything you'd like to emphasize that you've already said, please go ahead. I guess I would just say it's so important for everyone in Namibia to know and for the message to be incredibly clear that uh, these are hard weeks that we're now in. And we potentially have some really hard weeks ahead of us. Uh, things are already the worst they've been this year for COVID in Namibia. Uh, we don't want it to get even worse than this. We need to be paying close attention to what's happening in our hospitals. And we need the public to be fully on board with protecting our healthcare workers. Those are your sisters and your brothers, your cousins, your friends working in those hospitals. Uh, and they're the people that are gonna save your life 
or your kid's life or my kid's life when they get sick and they need some urgent medical care for any reason. So we, that needs to be really the center of the story right now is what are we all doing to stop this from getting any worse than it is? We don't have uh, more of a safety net. You know, Some other countries out there are blessed with just many more hospitals, many more doctors. You know, Namibia doesn't have the breadth of medical resources that some countries do. We can't handle this getting much worse than it already is. Uh, and we need the whole country to get on board for that. Dr. Eric Juwan of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Namibia. Thank you very much for joining us for this episode, which is also our last episode of 2020. Hopefully we'll talk to you again in, in the new year at some point. Um, but thank you very much for making the time for us um, for this talk, Doctor. My pleasure, thank you. And uh, I hope you, I hope we don't have a, too much of a disrupted uh, Christmas and uh, please uh, stay safe and, and healthy. Um, everybody who um, watches this, um, now and, and afterwards, because we seem to be getting most of our views after we've actually recorded this when we've posted it to YouTube. So please stay safe and healthy, everyone. Um, and thanks once again, doctor. Um, if, is there a message also that uh, for this festive season that you want to, to just send, give people? Um, yeah, have happy holidays, uh, Merry Christmas, uh, a Merry festive season to everyone. It'll be one unlike any other in our lifetimes, uh, but the most important aspects haven't changed. The, the reason for Christmas that I celebrate hasn't changed. Um, the people that I care most about, my ability to show love to them hasn't changed. So uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna lose some of the stuff that we like about the holidays and we might have to make some tough choices, but uh, the, the real important parts are still there. And the safer we are, the more of us can be around to celebrate next year hopefully in a in a less intense environment all right then thank you doctor bye, -bye.